The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. We want to welcome everybody that's joining us live on Facebook and YouTube and around the world. We, we enjoy getting those little snippets that say, watching you from some country that I never heard of. And <laughs> so keep it up. <clears throat> those of you that are watching online as well as here in the congregation, our emphasis today is going to be on a God encounter. And God's basically been saying to us again and again to bring back what we used to do when we were in the other building. And that was more of a corporate expression. So that means you do your homework during the week just like I do. You need to hear what the Lord's saying to you specifically. But a God encounter, that, that, that's what we're going to title except, today. Except we want it in the congregation, not what the Lord is speaking to individuals. But right, God right. Is speaking to oh, that's, that's a big truth because that was developed with maturity. Uh, when we've done this in the past, we saw there's a difference between what God is speaking to you as an individual. Like I had a dream and God told me da 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 da. No, no. What we're trying to do is get the heart of the congregation, the heart of the family. What is He speaking to us corporately? And that takes that takes a different heart attitude. It takes an openness to one another and a corporate heart attitude that's this way, not just this way. You know. I never did like that expression. We worship to an audience of one. Not, the audience needs to be our love and worship going forward to the Father, yes. But he wants to, Jesus wants to express his voice through a corporate expression. So it's many voices being lifted up simultaneously. So I just feel like one of the things God's saying about an encounter is that encounter is specifically for where you're at right now. And so we want to do some ministry this morning, too. Except and we, I have a few things. Except Jennifer has a few things to say. So. And I want to tell you right now, you know one of the first things that President Trump did, he signed an executive order so we are not bound by the Johnson Amendment anymore. Yeah. We can, we can talk about politics, we can endorse candidates, we can talk, we, can, we are not muzzled anymore. He said the church has got her voice back. So in light of that, um, what we're really facing now is a battle between good and evil. And I want you to know that anybody who can endorse a platform that includes killing babies, it's not God. So we are right now in like I said, in a war between good and evil and the destiny of this country. And this country was given to God, made a covenant with God, three separate covenants with God in our founding. And God very much has his hand on America in the, much the same ways he has his hand on Israel, the only two nations in the history of the world that were created in a covenant with God, with a God-given destiny. Right now we're in a time where the nations, and Jesus was promised the nations by his Father, we're going to see the development of sheep and goat nations in the earth. I vote to be a sheep nation because right. it does not go well for the goat nations. <laughs> okay, and I wanted to share with you all that's been going on. I have a word from Dutch Sheets um, on the back table, if you'd please pick that up before you go. And it's a, it's a good word, but it asks us to commit and please to... Please don't 15. email us and ask for a copy. We can't do that. Okay. Right. Pick one up while you're here. Or Google Dutch Sheets, but don't use Google. Use a different search engine. There you go. <laughs> but anyway, I've made a commitment, and I hope all of you will commit to praying at least 15 minutes a day between now and whenever this is all resolved. And I wanted to share with you let, that... Let me just do this one thing. Let's, let's get a commitment now. Okay. There's yes. all kinds of prayer, you know. The scripture says, 
pray with all kinds of prayer. One of them is a prayer of commitment. How many want to commit to a more intensive prayer? I'm not going to limit to 15 minutes or, or maybe right. put a timetable on it. Just, Father, right now, this is going to be a season of prayer in my life, and I'm going to pursue you. And by the grace of God, I will accomplish uh, a greater and closer and more intimate connection with you. That this is a time of prayer. And, and I commit and consecrate myself to that in Jesus name. But Amen. this is specifically to commit to praying for our nation. Right. Daily. And um, back when I taught the seminar in God we trust and it's got the manual I think there's 12 CDs and a manual if you're interested in getting that. We've had Christian schools take it as their curriculum when teaching American history and it will be a book eventually. Yeah. Um, Explain what you did. Jennifer put back all the God stuff that was very systematically removed from our history. Deliberately. Except if it, was, if it was in a bad light, then they kept it in, like Salem witch trials and those evil crusades. They would keep it in if it was in a bad light, but they took out all the God stuff from our founding fathers. And, and, what they and said. a lot more, and they made America look terrible. Howard's in the history of America, bad, bad, bad book, and it's been used in our schools for, what, 20 years now? Um, so in the colonies, before the Revolutionary War, pastors took a very active role because we know that Jesus is the author of liberty. One of his, um, two of his statements in his mission statement when he stood up in Luke chapter 4 was to set the captives free, yes. to lift the oppressed out of bondage. Um, it was very common in the days of the colonies that several times a year the pastors would preach election sermons about the necessity of us being involved in our government. As a matter of fact, Patrick Henry, one of my favorite founding fathers, said it cannot be emphasized too clearly and too often that this nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians, not on religion, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. For this very reason, people of other faiths have been afforded asylum, prosperity, and freedom of worship here. Thomas Paine, in his book Common Sense, said, this new world has been the asylum for the persecuted lovers of civil and religious liberty from every part of Europe. Hither have they fled, not from the tender embraces of the mother, but from the cruelty of the monster. And it is so far true of England that the same tyranny which drove the first immigrants from home pursues their descendants still. And this is the monster we are fighting today. Um, now, the preachers are the ones who kept the message of liberty alive. The preachers in the pulpits. As a matter of fact, the British were furious at the pastor, so much so that during the, the Revolutionary War, they would board up churches with the congregations inside and burn them down. They were so mad at them. They called in the black robed regiment because of the black robes they wore in the pulpit, the long black robes that went from neck to, show, to ankle. Now, when the British, you know, after the Declaration of Independence, the signers of the Declaration were literally signing their death warrants. They were committing high treason against England. And so, needless to say, everybody pitched in to keep them hidden. And where did the British go to look for them? They went to look in the churches, where the pastors and congregations would give them shelter. And Paul Revere. Right, Paul Revere. When he, was warn when he went to warn that the British were coming, he went directly to a church to find Sam, da Sam Adams. But because of Paul Revere, Sam Adams and some of the other founders were able to get away. And we know that none of the founders were actually caught by the British during the Revolutionary War, which is a miracle. There's so many miracles that happened in the Revolutionary War. And you know what? It looked like they wouldn't win. If you read 
a history of the Revolutionary War. There was no reason they won except God. God had his hand upon them, but you know what? He likes to squeak out a victory so no man can take the credit. Like with Gideon, he whittled the army down till it was only 300 and defeated a nation with 300 men. So let's be the remnant and let's defeat the enemy with a remnant. And it, not all the churches, but some faithful people in the churches. Now, John Peter Mullenberg, he was a pastor, and you know, the Declaration of Independence was signed July in July 4th, 1776. Now, in January of 1776, it was John Peter Mullenberg, he preached on for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven from Ecclesiastes 3.1. He was a 30-year-old member of the Virginia House of Burgesses and also a pastor. His brother was also a pastor in New York. He closed his message by saying, in the language of Holy Writ, there is a time for all things. There is a time to preach and a time to fight. And now is the time to fight. And he threw off his pulpit robe, and underneath he was wearing the uniform of a revolutionary soldier. And he grabbed a musket, and he marched out of the church saying, all who are ready to come and enlist with me, follow me now. 300 men got up and followed him out the doors of the church. They formed the 8th Regiment in the Continental Army. And he was there at Valley Forge when the men were fighting barefoot in the snow, literally wearing rags. And the, the um, states were bound only by the Articles of Confederation. There was nothing that compelled them to give. And so the men who fought in the Revolutionary War had no uniforms provided, no food provided, although my um, not, not um, what's his name? Your radical Merrill, right? Samuel Merrill, these are not Jennifer's not, radical revolutionary right. ancestors. Right, I had There's statues of these people. John Merrill, he he was actually drawn and quartered before the um, by the British before before committing treason for fighting against the British. But even the British said he gave his Christian he testimony. gave his Christian testimony before he was drawn and quartered, and they said, "Truly, here is a righteous man." I think she's got a little bit of that DNA. Uh, <laughs> The Captain fighter. Benjamin Merrill. Captain Benjamin Merrill. You can Merrill. look him up historically. Right, the Battle of Alamance. There's a plaque to him up in um, near Fayetteville, but don't Peter, cross her. <laughs> <laughs> but most of the <coughs> regiments <coughs> in the Continental Army were formed in exactly this same way. Congregations of churches. The men became. For the benefit of, of those watching by Ustream and YouTube, too, keep in mind when they said they removed the Davidson Act. How many even know what the Davidson Act was? That was preachers were not allowed to say much of anything politically because you would lose your 501c3 tax deduction. It's also called the Johnson, the Johnson oh, I Act. I mean, what did I say? Davidson. No, Johnson Act. Yeah. Same thing. You got the point? Right. And there are many to this day that did not know that Trump, through executive order, had that removed. Right. And so there's many, many of preachers, uh, and I've had them even call me for counseling, churches of 3,000, matter of fact, and say, how come my people don't know anything? And I said, do you teach it? Well, no. Well, we teach it. We teach it. <laughs> OK. All the ideas contained in the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights had been proclaimed by these patriot pastors for well over a hundred years before Thomas Jefferson ever wrote down that we have the right, God-given right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, also known as property rights. Nobody can take your property. Um, Years preaching on God, government, and liberty, and the rights of man, God's principles of liberty, God's design for good civil government, and man's duty to choose godly Christian leaders. Let me find this quote over here. John Adams. Just push me over.
John Adams, we have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by, by um, morality and religion. Avarice, ambition, revenge, or gallantry would break the strongest cords of our Constitution as a whale goes through a net. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. And one of the founders also said that take care that you elect Christians for your leaders. By the way, there's a number oh, here it is. during this current election in the House and Senate that are clearly Christian women. And I was really glad to see that. Pro-life. Pro-life Christian women. And John Jay. Well, actually, to me, that would be an oxymoron to say it any other way. How could you be a Christian, Christian and be woman. for killing babies? Yeah. Seriously. <clears throat> and. Oh, but what's the little lie that goes around? It's like the little. Oh, there are other issues besides abortion. Well, if you get the life part wrong of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. You're not going to get the rest well, of it right. The rest of it's automatically wrong. But John Jay said, Providence has given to our people the choice of their rulers. And it is the duty as well as the privilege and interest of our Christian nation to select and prefer Christians for their rulers. So this is your post-election sermon, but this is, it, is what, is while we are praying. <laughs> is it really no, post? No, it's got, we've got until January 18th. Okay, one, one more, well, two more quotes. This day we fight. The battle is not over. This That's Lord day, of the Rings. Yes. Didn't you uh, love anybody Lord of the Rings, see rather. that? When he came out in that, that horrible army and he said, this is not a day to despair. This day we fight. This is the, I live with this. <laughs> this is not an act. She's not little much afraid anymore. She's not little much afraid anymore. Uh -oh. Okay. So anyway... The evil has been revealed. Everybody knows about elections being stolen. Everybody knows the fraud. Nobody knew the extent of it. For our country to go forward, it needs to have the corruption removed. Amen. Do you know that there are um, there's software being used that was developed by the CIA for the purpose of stealing elections? It's in all the battleground states. There are either 28 or 38 other states that are using a software called Dominion and it flips a percentage of the votes whatever you calibrate it to and it is owned by Nancy Pelosi's husband so that's what's going on the here foundation is the Clinton well um, so anyway we had a representative we know who uh, a South Carolina representative actually he's preached here before Samuel Rivers Samuel Rivers so South he, Carolina. He to talk he's, about he's a all this. black Republican pastor. <laughs> Boy, he's got everything against him. Right? And, he's and he was winning in, in South election. Carolina in his election till suddenly three o'clock in, in the, the morning, morning. Three in the morning, he lost. A whole bunch of votes showed up because he called up for prayer because he's he he wanted prayer for really for Christians that the only information they have is the news. And the news is not your government. Right, so you need to get better sources than just listening to the news. They're not, they're not legal. We understand <laughs> that a lot of people are going to Newsmax and One America News and CitizenFreePress.com. If you start there, you're in good shape. Okay, <laughs> a couple of other quotes and then we'll go with whatever else is going to happen this morning. With this possibility of cleaning up the corruption going forward with God's hand on this nation, as Thomas Paine said <clears throat> in 7076 in Common Sense, we have it in our power to begin 
the world again. Mm. And Joseph Warren at the Boston Massacre, his Boston Massacre oration, our country is in danger, but not to be despaired of. Our enemies are numerous and powerful, but we have many friends determining to be free, and heaven and earth will aid the resolution. On you depend the fortunes of America. You are to decide the important question on which rests the happiness and liberty of millions yet unborn. Act worthy of yourselves. I vote for her. Thank you. Let me let me look at some of the things that I jotted okay. down here. I'm going to believe for an encounter this morning, based on what you need, because if there's any any issue that's standing between you and God, now's the time to deal with it this morning, because we're going to we want to go forward in a one accord prayer emphasis. If there's anybody depressed, hurt, let's deal with that. Anybody feeling bad, negative, what have you, those are walls that come between you and God. And just like the Lord spoke to me when he was discipling me in the school of the Spirit, Dennis, don't let anything come between what you and I have together. That word is good for you just as well as me. We're all individuals and we have to have our own relationship with God. Do not let anything come. There are, there are people, Republicans and Democrats, that basically want the reality. There are plenty of Democrat people who, even if they won, they, in their own heart, there's a good portion of them that would like to know if they really won. Don't you think? But they didn't. Hmm? But they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but isn't that true? Wouldn't you want to know? Because otherwise, otherwise, it's what we've heard from people in foreign countries. They say, well, yeah, we can vote, but it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter. It's a useless thing. I want the scrutiny to be developed regardless of the result, primarily because in going forward, otherwise elections will be just like a third world country. It doesn't mean anything. It's just some kind of little formality to make the leaders look good that you vote, vote. but, you know, I used to have a friend that was in a, uh, uh, he was a, uh, an Italian family from old school Italian and he would meet with his young boys and uh, they had a business together and he'd say you guys want to vote vote well we're going to do what I say <laughs> you know so it didn't really matter that they voted but he gave them a chance and if all the boys said no we don't want to do that he goes too bad we're going to do it <laughs> so we don't want that to happen in a country do we no absolutely not and I want to challenge us to, uh, for a God encounter to find out where we're at as a people, even right now. Pray for us. Is there anybody who doesn't have a prayer language that would like to be prayed for? Don't be scared. Anybody? All right. Well, I want to pray for the people that are watching online. There's way more people watching online than's in this room. And so we need to take into account. And they're part of us. And they've been a part of us for years, many of them. So Father, right now, I just want to pray that uh, if you've born again and you've received Jesus into your, into your heart and into your life, uh, then to be filled with the Spirit is to release yourself and allow God to speak through you. And by allowing God to speak through you, He is not going to move your tongue. He is not going to force open your mouth. You speak, and the Spirit gives utterance. In other words, you speak, you begin with childlike faith. I don't care if, you, if it's just a couple of syllables. You give those syllables to God. It was like a little boy explained it to me. We were very young. He got filled with the Holy Spirit. He said, it was like, it was like I gave God my like alphabet cereal. He said, I gave God all of the alphabets and told him, you make a prayer out of it, God. <laughs> but let's all of us here while he's praying for those out there, let's pray in the Spirit. Just pray them. in the Spirit for those. Who they, they really need a deeper dimension of the reality of Jesus. And there's... And, and, and one of the key indications is that it does one thing. 
in your, in your heart of hearts, if you don't get up in your head and argue, as you release that and receive the fullness of the Spirit of God, and you begin to pray in your prayer language very softly, you can even whisper it, it keeps you in the love of God, and it builds you up in the most holy faith. So there's two wonderful aspects of it. So, and it takes childlike humility to surrender your language to the Lordship of Jesus and let it fill, flooded with God, flooded with God. Thank God I'm flooded with God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Increase, 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 increase. God basically wants to take us from Christ is for me. Okay? Is there anyone that struggles with the fact that God loves them? All right? I'm going to have to take that. I can't go with my congregation. You're too mature. I'm going to have to go to the audience. All right? There's people that struggle with the Father's love. There's people that are in depression right now. And I want to pray for them right now. Is that I receive... Now listen, this takes personal responsibility here. Instead of the blame game and circumstances and people are picking on me. Instead, I receive forgiveness for taking in that evil report. I receive forgiveness down in my heart. I receive forgiveness for taking in an evil report and taking in fear and hopelessness. It's the opposite. It's the opposite because the spirit doesn't disappoint. Hope doesn't disappoint. And hope is open. It doesn't shut down. There's people shut down right now, and you need to reopen to God. Open to God. Open to life. Open to one another again. Shutting down does not protect you. Shutting down will make you sick. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. So, Father, we're going to pray right now at the point of need that there's multitudes of people, good Christians too, who got discouraged and wanted to quit. They let circumstances speak to them. There is a significant difference between hope in an outcome and hope in God. You put your hope in God over a hope in an outcome. Both are good, but hope in an outcome cannot dominate hope in God. Hoping, hope is open, open to God, open to life, open to one another, open to God. My God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory. All right, that means all. So, Father, right now in Jesus' name, I want to pray for anybody that wants to come up and, and you just feel like you need prayer and you don't even know what, we'll figure it out. Anyone wants to come up right now? Otherwise, I'm going to keep praying for these people. Okay, I want to pray for you because you, have, you don't feel that which is an impossibility. And I saw you crying back there, so don't tell me you can cry without feeling, right? Yeah, okay, so there it goes. We're going to get rid of that lie that I can't feel. Put your hand down here. All right. That first person or situation that comes to mind, just nod your head. says it's on. Now it's on? Yes. Okay. Your will is here, and it's unnatural to fall backwards. You would have to yield your will to fall backwards. Fall back about six inches. There you go. Did you feel that? Did you see what you did down there? You let go. So you can feel, but you've been traumatized a great deal in your life, right? Then you've got to there you are, you're yielding. Now when you yield, you don't have to fall back because now you know how to do it. Very good. That's yielding. You can yield without falling now. And what you're yielding to is not to me, not to a person. You yield to the Jesus in you. Okay. Now, let's go back to that person or situation. Nod your head. 
Let's go back to what we saw before. Feel the feeling, discomfort. You don't have an emotional language, so the yuck that's down there, let Jesus, oh, you're doing it, Jesus, the forgiver is going right through it and changing it to peace. Pretty good. Don't expect lightning bolts. That was very good. It changed. When it changes down here, it's like salvation. When you receive him, you receive peace with God. There's a supernatural transaction that only God and the Spirit can do. And you just did it. And you, That change is permanent. That change is permanent now. You want to check it out? Picture that person in your head. And you're gonna, you, the smiling gives it away too. You don't usually smile until there was some kind of an internal change there. Because the seat of the emotions goes up the vagus nerve and informs your head, I felt good. Your head catches up to what your heart already knows. If there's a loud crash in this room, you would jump. The emotion would cascade throughout your body before your head knew what happened. And that's what happened to you. You're doing the 60 day challenge now. You're gonna, you're gonna do great. You got it, you can, you can sit down. I wanna, get, I wanna get Tim. She's doing the 60 day challenge and she came and she was all troubled because she, she can't feel. People that can't feel have learned to shut down. God made you a thinking, feeling, choosing being. And the only way you would not feel is you've made a decision not to. And that's an act of your will and nobody can make you feel, but you can yield your will and allow yourself to feel. And if you had a lot of traumas, that you're afraid to feel, like it's gonna, you're gonna explode. No, you keep suppressing it and you will explode. You'll have a breakdown. You express it momentarily, key word. Those of you watching, when I say, face your pain. Christians are, are known for running from their pain, suppressing their pain, rationalizing their pain. Oh well, yes, my father abused me, but he was doing the best that he could. You know what that is? That's a rationalization. That's an excuse. That doesn't heal your pain. Understanding does not heal emotional pain. Only Jesus can take the pain. Tim, you're in a kind of a rough situation. That's why he's here from England. I want you to just close your eyes, picture any of the situations that's going on. Just nod your head. Feel the feeling and nod your head. Okay. I want you to do two things. I want you to release forgiveness to that person or situation. Nod your head and change of peace. Sorry, huh? Now, I want you to do something else. This keeps you from being a victim. I receive forgiveness. It's like drinking in. I receive forgiveness for taking it in. People that have done rejection, they get good and proficient at forgiving people, but not necessarily do they ever learn to stand and not take it in in the first place. You have a right to your well-being and peace can guard your heart and your mind and if somebody can reject you doesn't mean you have to suck it in. That's their opinion, that's their action, but it doesn't have to be your response. Thank you Jesus, thank you Lord. Anybody else want prayer? Raise your hand, because if not, I'm going to keep Tim up here. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you. All right. Now, can we pray through something where you can actually say it out loud? That would benefit the people watching. In public, I don't have them. I usually have them nod their head, person or situation. And it's been everything from major abuse to a minor irritation on the road, okay? But for the people to learn something by it, to where me dying to my flesh, I could release life to other people. First person or situation, can you say it? It's my mom. Okay. 
All right, and you already got the emotion because I could feel it on your words, right? Mm -hmm. And what would you describe the emotion? Rejection. Mm -hmm. From her? From her. From her. But he's all the way here from England to take care of her. So I want you to receive forgiveness for taking in that rejection. Nod your head when it changes to peace. It's peace. Okay, now I want you to release out of your belly flow rivers of loving forgiveness to her. <laughs> Actually, it just changed. It went from peace to a little joy bubble. Am I right? Very good, very good. Oh my, it's a good place for filling for emotional needs. Yeah, let's do that. Stay here. More. Yep. More. Here's this Long day. in in Keep days going. past when I did private one on one ministry that I don't do. Don't email me, okay? <laughs> for private one on one ministry, I've trained enough people, including you can do this yourself. That you don't need the professional. That's old school. You and Jesus have to have a relationship, your own relationship, not somebody doing something to you. Fortunately, God gave me discerning of the human spirit, and I could feel when someone was doing it right and when they were doing it wrong. But ultimately, you can discern what's going on in you. You shouldn't demand someone else knows what's going on in you. When it's your relationship with God, you should know if you're troubled or not. You should know if you're relaxed or stressed. That's your responsibility. But we'd like to put it on someone else to go like this and I'm okay. All right. But here's the beautiful part. This is something I only saw privately for many years. After they would forgive for rejection, after they receive, okay, the heart is pure. You're not demanding from mom acceptance, are you? You released forgiveness. Absolutely cleansed. Totally cleansed, okay. Now, close your eyes. All that I needed and didn't receive, I'm receiving acceptance, that I was accepted in the beloved, and you're drinking it in. Your spirit is absorbing acceptance that's coming righteously from God instead of demanding it from people. All that I needed and didn't receive, I'm drinking in that acceptance right now. I'm a one of a kind. There never was another Tim. There never will be another Tim. And I belong. And because I belong, I've got a lot to give. <laughs> can you feel that in your spirit? Really it's can. not just words, huh? Yeah, it's more than words. It's more than it's words because there's an anointing on it. My strongest anointing is acceptance. But my biggest wounding was rejection. Yeah. On the other side of your pain is an anointing. And your worst attacks can be your greatest strengths. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, I like that. That's called filling. Thank you, John. Thank you. Filling doesn't work until you've released demands and expectations on getting it from people. <laughs> now, you're proficient at this. What are you doing up here? Come on. Know. You know how to do it. If you can say it out loud, it helps the people watching. Because uh, like, after a couple of weeks, there'll be over a thousand people that have seen this service. Mm -hmm. There's some that know absolutely nothing. So I want if they have more information without, mm -hmm. without slandering anybody, okay? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. It's tricky, <laughs> yeah. all right? Mm. Okay, first person or situation. When I say first person or situation, you're trusting God, whatever comes up, just like a little child, I just deal with it. You're not analyzing and you're not probe. Oh, okay, there's a nice anointing on you right now. I just feel sad. Okay. And can you see where the sadness is? What's the picture? Um, maybe hope. Um, the situation? Like, yeah, okay. family, kids. Family, kids, okay. All right. And I want you to receive forgiveness. Receive forgiveness for taking it in. Because hope deferred makes the heart sick. And this is what I sensed when we started a service. That there was people that got, got beat over the head with hopelessness. Oh, that's it. Now receive, receive forgiveness. 
now we're going to go out. It's called release. But you're letting go from the heart, not the head. What? Okay, I'm letting go. Whoa, 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 whoa. I don't want to lose you yet because I want to take this farther. <laughs> you're yielded really good. All right, yep, you are. She is. I want you to release demands and expectations on the family. That means I got to let go. I release demands and expectations on everybody's performance. This is Romans 14.4. The Living Bible says it really nice. They are God's servants, not yours, even your children. They belong to Him, not to you. God is able to tell them whether they're right or wrong. God is able to make them do as they should. Do you believe that? That's the Bible, but it's living paraphrase translation. Romans 14.4, Living Bible. So what we want to do now is say it is nice. Do it. Corroborates it. I release demands and expectations. Yes. Uh, I'm putting them in. This is for your health. This is for your spiritual health. And it'll restore the joy of your salvation. Ooh. Thank you, Lord. Increase, increase. How many people could restore peace and joy in their life if they could honestly let go from the heart instead of just the head? And that's really, that's the joy of the spirit. That's really bubbling up. If you, if, if you could go from hopeless to that, wouldn't you let go? There's nothing that important that you've got to hang on to. In Jesus' name, amen. Very good. Thank you. And Jennifer struggled with, with Allison when she was a teenager. And she says she let go. And I look at her and she go, that girl, that girl, she better, and I'm gone. You said you let go. And I said, if you really did it right, if you really let go right, you wouldn't keep bringing it up over and over again. So I said, say out loud, because I was praying with her silently, and she said, yeah, I know how to do this, and I did it. And I said, Jennifer, say out loud what you did. I released Allison to the Lord. Yeah, I released Allison to the Lord, as long as she don't get in trouble. I'm going, that's a string. That is not release. You have your criteria all attached to it, right? And if you're watching Allison, I kept it mild. <laughs> huh? Release of demands and expectations. Let's do that corporately and for the people in the audience. Releasing demands and expectations. It's not like they're not supposed to fulfill a certain role. But that's between them and God, isn't it? You can't make anybody do anything. And I had p mothers particularly argue with me, oh, yes, you can. <laughs> I'm going, oh, well, we'll see how long that lasts. You make that girl say, you're not wearing that uh, low-cut top to school. Change. Until she walks out the door, she can do whatever she wants after she's out of that door. You, you don't have any control. So you might think you can make somebody do something, but not really, because they're standing up on the inside. You could tell them to sit down, but they're standing up on the inside. You didn't win anything. You raise them in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, and you give them proper instruction, but you cannot make anybody do anything. Some of you people would enjoy a lot more freedom in the spirit if you could let people go. You ready to let people go? You watching by YouTube and, uh, and uh, Facebook? First person or situation that comes, could be a group, could be an individual person. Ah, could be a situation, something at work. Mm, oh, I could felt an anointing on that one. There's a lot of people dealing with situations that you think you're going to change the situation, when in reality God wants you to be the best person you can be on that stinky old job. I know you're going to change the boss and you're going to change the way it's working, but it's not going to. You better let it go. Let's let it go. If God placed you there, it's for your development. Father, I release, first of all, demands and expectations on situations. I feel really strongly there's a lot of situations. I release those demands and expectations on that situation. 
I release. I let it go from my heart, not to head, but from my heart I release it. When I can picture that situation at work or what have you, when I can picture that situation in my mind and I have peace in my gut, I truly let it go. If there's no peace, there's only tension or apprehension in the gut, then you didn't let it go. So I release it and I let it go. Do you know people with eating disorders, it's a control issue. People with all different kinds of problems, it's control, control, control. You were bought with a price, you are not your own. Why not just my body, soul, and spirit, give myself to God, offer myself a living sacrifice, and that includes your emotions and it includes your will. For it is God who is at work both, both, say both, both, to will and to do. So that means you need the grace of God as the motor. You need the grace of God as empowerment. You need the grace. It's not about you striving. I want to pray for graduating from, from the child. The child struggles mostly with trying to live the Christian life and self-effort. I'm going to pray that prayer. If you're, you're uh, still a baby Christian spiritually, I don't care how long you've been in the church, that doesn't mean anything. But you're still a baby Christian if you're, you're trying to live the Christian life in your own strength. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I repent of being a selfer. I receive forgiveness for trying to live the Christian life in my own strength. I get wore out, I get tired. Means that I'm trying, not trusting. To try, T-R-Y, means to temporarily resist yielding. But when I yield to Him, He works. And it is God who is at work in me. You saw people up here get some ministry? That was God working in them. That was not my anointing. That was their Jesus in them. I was simply facilitating. And the good part about being able to discern the human spirit is I can tell that what they said was true. But they need to know what they said was true. That's more important. Right? Galatians 2.20. We're going to move from the child who struggles with self-effort to Galatians 2.20. For it is no longer I who live, but Jesus the Messiah in me. And this life that I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who gave me. That's a replacement. We're going to go for a deeper walk. We're no longer children. Now our primary emphasis is to stay joined together with Him. For it is no longer I who live, no longer I who love, no longer I who forgive, but we. It's a new creation me. It's a joined to the Lord, our one spirit with Him. I'm moving from the child and self-effort to now I, my my entire effort is to remain in union with Him and to not operate out of the independent self, not to be drawn away to operate independently. I'm going to learn to abide in, like John 15. I am joined to the Lord. I am one spirit with Him. When I, in this place of growth, you're moving from the child to the young man. You're moving from the, the young man who is strong and overcome the wicked one. And uh, the Word of God abides in them. Abide being the, the, the key word there. Abide means it's dwelling in union and communion most of the time. It's only when you sin that that independent self comes out. Now the child lives out of that self, trying to live the Christian life, getting burned out. But the young man, his effort is to not sin. Through yielding, to Jesus. through yielding to Jesus, learning to stay yielded, learning to abide in His presence. Because the, the young men, I mean, the, your young will get weary and worn out. And the enemy right now for the church at large is trying to wear out the saints of the Most High. But they that know their God, know, intimately know their God, will be strong and do exploits. And so now we're going to pray for even third level. The second level is, it's no longer I who love, but Jesus. It's no longer I who forgive. How do you love if it's not His love? 
it just cut off again. All right? We love because he first loved us. We forgive, but the, the forgiver in us does the forgiving. And this is our Robbie robot. All right? You know what the third level is? In the first level, it's me. The second level, it's we. The third level is just him. It's like washed by the blood of the lamb, they overcame by the blood. That's the child. Overcame by the word of their testimony. That's the young man, young woman. Loving not their lives unto the death. That death worketh in me, that life would work in you. Then it's just God. It's just God and that everything is working God through me. Third level, offer your body a living sacrifice. Let's do that. Spirit, soul, and body. I was bought with a price, I'm not my own. I don't have a right to control my emotions, my will, and my physical body is being offered to you that you would be that energizing force going through me to the world around and that I would labor that Jesus be formed in others, that death worketh in me, that life might work in someone else. That third level, we pursue it. It's like going from the outer court to the inner court to the Holy of Holies and staying there. And holiness in the Holy of Holies is He is holy. Be holy, for I am holy, says the Lord. The only way you can do that is staying in the abiding Holy of Holies. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What else should we pray? How about some deliverance? Deliverance for a Christian is hitchhikers. Hitchhikers attach to a Christian based on an area that you won't surrender. Self-deliverance is something every Christian could do. It's the demon is not in you. It's hitchhiking and attached to unhealed areas in your life. So it harasses, torments. So Father, right now, any area of torment, any area, any situation that comes to mind, any repetitive issue, that you have in your life gives place to the enemy to harass you. Is there, lift up your hand if you can see, you don't have to tell me, but lift up your hand if you can see a repetitive, there's that same old, same old. All right, very good, very good. That same old, same old is an indication. Let's close your eyes. Many people raise their hands on that. That same old, same old. I'm doing good in my other areas of my Christian life, but there's that same old, same old. Okay. Then I'm going to say, where, Holy Spirit, show me where did I give place to that? And the first memory that comes to mind, where did I give place to that? Where did that start? And just like a child, don't analyze it, don't critique it. Just take that area and receive forgiveness for giving place, knowingly or unknowingly. That's very important the way I'm stating that. Knowingly or unknowingly, I gave place to the enemy. Knowingly or unknowingly, but nevertheless, I gave place to the enemy in that area. I receive forgiveness for knowingly or unknowingly giving place to the enemy. I release anyone that was involved in that situation. I release even demands where I got mad at God, if that's the case. God, self, and others, I'm allowing forgiveness to flow to me, to others, and even if I've judged God, I release that judgment. Now you have peace in that area. The enemy cannot attach to the fruit of the Spirit. You get peace on that forgiveness. The enemy cannot hitchhike on the fruit of the Spirit. He cannot penetrate 
nor attached to the fruit of the Spirit. So if you've made your peace in that area, you've gotten deliverance to the point where you can feel lighter, even if it's mild, that's the way deliverance should be for a Christian. It shouldn't be all kinds of weird manifestations. You're saved, but it can stop the harassment. It can stop by closing the door at the point of entry. Doesn't the scripture say, give no place to the devil? Remember Jesus said, the devil comes, but he has nothing in me. He doesn't have a foothold. He doesn't have something. If you have a repetitive, same old, same old, there's a place where he comes and gives, and it's like scratching a wound. That same old, same old, guess who's got control of that same old, same old? You do. Your responsibility is to close that door once and for all. No strings. Are you ready? Father, in the name of Jesus, I not only close that door, but I release forgiveness for having opening the door, knowingly or unknowingly. I've allowed that in. The repetition has, showed me, the repetition has clearly showed me that I have something to where I've given place to it. I receive forgiveness, and when I get my peace, that closes the door. And peace will guard your heart and your mind through Jesus. Peace will guard your heart and your mind. Peace is not passive. Peace is militant. And the God of peace can crush the enemy beneath your feet. That peace is armor, supernatural armor. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now you're all healed up. Plan on praying. And next Sunday, I'm expecting people to come up with a word that God was speaking to them through the week for the church, not just for you. Or, yeah, it can be spontaneous while you're here, but also be aware that you're praying for the church because in one accord, we can accomplish great things. If one can chase a thousand to ten thousand, there's an exponential factor in praying in one accord, praying in agreement. So, and if you don't, Jennifer is going to hit you with more <laughs> history lessons. <laughs> Amen. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.